everyone, it's Jo Witten. Welcome to Quirky Cooking Chats. Today is Ask Me a Question Day. Okay, so one of the questions I've had today is why have I made my garden in a spiral? I have a triangular shaped yard here at the top. I'll show you from the other side. And um, so a spiral fit into this area really nicely. We were gonna have rectangular beds and we realized we'd have a lot of wasted space. So instead we have a spiral with triangular beds. So I'm not sure if you can see that. Right here is a potato garden I'm just watering. And over this side, there's another one. Um, I had a permaculture designer, permaculture garden designer come and help me and we worked out the best use of space and where things should be planted. And um, he said, what about a Fibonacci spiral? I think that's pretty quirky. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's awesome. <laughs> so we decided on the spiral. And um, yeah, it's working really well. I actually love it. It's also really fun. I had some friends over the uh, yesterday and the kids thought it was great. It's sort of like a little maze so they can walk the spiral. Um, and once the plants get bigger, I think it'll be really cool walking around the spiral. So yeah, just a bit of fun really, but it just fits into my space really well. So um, there, there's spiral and triangles and yeah, it's just pretty. I think gardens should be um, something that looks beautiful as well as being practical and just um, you know brings you joy so I'm gonna have a lot of flowers in here as well as veggies and herbs. I've also had a lot of questions about um, conditioning the soil when you're just starting off um, and how to prepare the soil. I am not an expert gardener. This has been done very simply um, so all we did I will, if you go onto my Instagram, you can look at my garden highlights and you'll see every step because I've videoed everything and saved it in my highlights. But basically we just put cardboard over the grass to kill the grass. And then we piled um, soil, good quality soil that I bought um, for gardens, for veggie gardens. Um, I, pile, I bought a big, like a truckload of soil, trailer load, I guess, um, and piled that up and then mulch on top so that's sugarcane mulch and hay um, and that's all we've done so far the soil had compost and chook poo in it well rotted so everything's just taken off it's doing really well um, as you can see but um, i was thinking i might get a permaculture gardener on the podcast really soon um, to answer gardening questions because yeah, I'm not an expert, but it doesn't have to be complicated. I think we overcomplicate gardening sometimes and then we um, don't do it because it all feels so hard. And now I'm just like, oh my goodness, this much has been done in like three months or less. And I'm like, why didn't I start earlier? <laughs> potatoes here and leeks starting lots of herbs huge amounts of tomatoes going crazy lots of pumpkin um, I've got a mulberry tree which is doing really well heaps of baby mulberries on there so looking forward to seeing how it all goes this bit here is going to have a lot of herbs in the spiral in the center um, and I'm still, yeah, some things die and I start again. So there's a few gaps, but we're getting there. Next is the um, snow peas on the trellis near the shed. So yeah, I'm just loving it. It's so therapeutic and it's so nice having your own, having a few of your own veggies. Um, yeah, just in a backyard garden. Or if you don't have a, enough room for a garden, then pots and... Um, yeah, planting boxes. I used to have a little townhouse years ago and the garden at the front of the townhouse was two meters by one meter. And in that garden, I grew tomatoes, um, broccoli, herbs, um, some greens. <laughs> so yeah, you can do a lot even with a small space. And down here is going to be sweet potatoes. And I'm also gonna have nettles somewhere because I really 
love nettles for tea and for medicinal purposes. Yeah, little by little. begins here. This is the path through the garden. It continues around there. And then I have triangular beds in the spaces. For those of you who are interested, this is what my garden design looks like um, by Jay Jackson of um, Organic Motion. And um, you can see the triangular section of my yard and how the spiral works. And I have changed a little um, as I went along, adjusted it, but basically triangular gardens to fill the spaces and the spiral that ends in the herb spiral. Bone broths and meat stocks. I get questions about these all the time. Um, so I have done a complete video on that in the past. And if you scroll down, you can look at the link below for the meat stock video. Um, but basically the question I had today was, what is better for the gut, a short cooked meat stock or a long cooked bone broth on really low heat? And the answer is a short cooked meat stock. And the reason for that, um, not only because a meat stock that's cooked for a short time is lower in histamines, which is often an issue for people with gut health issues. Um, it's also because the, um, the proteins in a short cooked stock are at higher levels. So the proteins that are really good for healing the gut, glycine, collagen, gelatin, proline, these are really high in a short cooked meat stock. Um, whereas a long cooked bone broth is higher in the kinds of proteins that and minerals that are great for healing bones and that kind of thing. So you'll get a different kind of um, a different kind of protein profile with each. If you're on the early stages of gut healing, you want the proteins that mend the cells of your gut lining. For mending the gut lining, short cooked meat stocks. Um, if you're later on in your healing journey, you might wanna bring in some long cooked bone broths, but I must admit I mostly do shorter stocks still um, because I just find them tasty and quick and easy to do and really great for gut health. So have a look at that video if you want more information. I'll just show you what I'm making over here. So here I'm about to cook a lamb meat stock. Um, I've got some, these straight out of the freezer, I've got some lamb neck chops and some lamb ribs. Basically um, all the bits and pieces that you don't really know what to do with um, if you buy your meat in bulk, you'll get a lot of those bits and pieces um, of meat on the bone or sort of scrappy bits like this. Um, they're great for making your meat stock. You want some bone in there. Um, if there's marrow, that's really good. And you want connective tissue. So you can see the neck chops are perfect for this. Um, I also use lamb shanks. They make a beautiful stock. And then all your like chicken legs, chicken um, necks, um, wings, um, I even use whole chicken, but the, it's mostly the one, the pieces that have the cartilage and um, the tendons and the bones and the marrow um, with some meat on the bone. That's what you want. So you can do any kind of meat and um, basically you cook it until the meat is soft and it easily comes off the bone and then it's ready. And then you can use the meat in soups and stews and things and it's not wasted. Um, so I just keep it very simple. I just have some sea salt and a bit of pepper. And I simmer, this will be simmered for about three hours because lamb, three to four hours for lamb, usually about two hours for chicken, three or four for beef and pork, um, depending on the cut. And always remember to not overfill the pot or you won't get that concentration of the um, amino acids, you won't get the really gelled kind of stock. So you want to um, just cover the meat, maybe one or two centimeters. And that's it. Bring it to a boil and then 
um, you can simmer it on low heat. So if you're using frozen meat like I am, you just bring it to a rolling boil and then you can turn it down and start your cooking time from then. A question from Emma. She wants to know what's my highest level of completed education? <laughs> Um, I did a diploma of graphic art at university and um, so that I guess that would be my highest um, official level of education. Um, I did start, so I went through school until grade 11 and then um, travelled overseas for a year and a half with my family doing distance ed and got my grade 12 certificate that way. Um, and then came back to Australia and went to university and I was going to do art teaching. So art was my first love, my first career. And um, as you can see, I've passed that love down to my daughter, Cassia, um, and she has way surpassed me. She's now illustrating a children's book, which is going to be amazing. Can't wait to show you. Anyway, um, so I went off to uni and I was going to do art teaching. So I started a teaching degree, um, but then I ended up um, swapping over to graphic design and um, graphic art and illustration. So I worked in that for quite a few years. And um, then the rest of the things that I've learnt, I've pretty much done, you know, courses here and there or um, just done a lot of research and a lot of reading. Um, Listen to a lot of seminars and just learnt things myself. And the health stuff, I learnt the hard way. <laughs> um, as my dad says, I learnt that in the school of hard knocks. Um, but I don't give medical advice. That's why I work with a nutritionist. So um, Elise Comerford is the nutritionist that I work with. So when we do online programs or retreats or seminars, um, she gives the nutritional advice. And I always send people to her for anything that's medical or nutritional. Um, and I just share, you know, the basic advice that um, I know is health and lifestyle advice that work, what my experience is that's really worked for me and for so many other people. Um, but yes, if you want a, a nutritionist, I really recommend Elise. She's amazing. She's been such a help to our family and to so many of my readers. So there are a few questions that I've been sent that are quite medical in nature and I would always pass those on to Elise. But things like um, someone asked if you can heal celiac disease through a gut healing diet. As far as I'm aware, you will always need to avoid gluten, but you can definitely reduce um, inflammation in the body and reactions to foods and all sorts of things that are associated with celiac disease um, by healing the gut. Um, and I've seen so many people, like myself included, who reacted to gluten, but I wasn't celiac, um, that I can now have um, sourdough bread now and then, like I did this morning, it was delicious. Um, and if I'm out and about and I get a bit of gluten, it's not a big deal but before it would have made me um, a bit sick and I would have had really itchy skin, which I used to scratch until it bled, <laughs> um, you know, bad acne, all of those kind of things were related to food reactions for me. Um, but having worked on gut health has made a huge difference and I can, um, like I eat probably 98% of the time I'm eating a really, you know, healthy, nutritious diet that's gluten-free. And then now and then I'll have some sourdough or something and, it, and it's fine. So one of the questions was how to work on gut health and gut healing um, when you have had your gallbladder removed and you're having trouble with fat digestion. So this is a question that Elise talks a lot about in our online program, the gut health formula, because um, we get so many questions from people who have trouble digesting fat. It's really common um, nowadays because um, in our society for the last, what, 70 years, we've been told fat is bad. And so people reduce the fat in their diet and try to have very little fat. Um, and so bile production goes down. So then when you start to work on healing and eating natural foods and traditional foods that are higher in fat, like um, the good fats like ghee and butter and um, egg yolks and avocado and um, animal fats, 
So those are really important for gut health and hormones and brain health. Um, but if you've had those out of your diet for a while and then you start to bring them back in, um, your body won't be producing enough bile to digest them, so you'll have issues. So Elise talks about how to increase bile production, how to um, just slowly bring in these healing foods um, in a really sustainable way so that you're not, um, you know, causing all sorts of reactions um, by doing it too quickly. So I would really recommend looking into the Gut Health Formula program if you need help with gut healing. Um, there were a couple of other questions that were similar, you know, to do with gut health um, that really would be best answered by a practitioner. Um, so Elise and her whole team of practitioners is there in the program to offer support for the eight weeks that the program is live. And then for 12 months, you've got the program to refer back to and watch the videos and download everything. Um, so the next intake is October the 7th. Otherwise, you can just get an appointment with Elise or her team at wellbellyhealth.com.au. One of the questions was, will there be another book? Yep, yeah, I'm sure there will be. <laughs> um, I'm always making up new recipes and um, trying them out sort of online. And sometimes I put them on the blog and sometimes I don't. Um, but I'm always collecting new ideas and new recipes and trying new things. And eventually um, I build up enough to make another cookbook. So um, I'm still not quite sure which direction the next cookbook will go. Um, I'm playing with a few different ideas and um, yeah, I'm not in a rush, but I am always thinking of new recipes. So if you go to my website, quirkycooking.com.au, you'll quite often see new recipes popping up on the blog. Um, and also follow on social media because you'll see plenty popping up there. Um, this last week, I put a recipe for a quick and easy Tex-Mex chili on the blog and I put my pumpkin pie recipe on the blog with the pumpkin pie spice mix. So at the moment, I'm working on recipes that use my spice mixes so I can get those out and people can scan the QR code on the front of the spice mix packet and find the recipes that go with the spices. So that's what I've been working on at the moment. One question was, what's your top favorite meal to cook? Um, to tell the truth, I am really getting more and more into simple traditional food and I just love a good slow cooked lamb shoulder, um, some roast veggies, a good salad with a lovely dressing um, and a nice dessert. Just something simple and slow cooked is probably my favorite. So yeah, like a slow cooked lamb shoulder or um, yeah, that's probably my favorite. <laughs> I know it sounds boring, but um, yeah, I just love simple food really. Um, when I make rich dishes, I can only eat a little bit of it, but I just love a good old fashioned roast. I mean, who doesn't? Um, but I do enjoy making more difficult and more, um, you know, fancier dishes as well, just because I, I love the art, the artisticness of it. <laughs> Is that a word? Um, I love doing things with pastry, um, breads, all of those sorts of things because it's just fun and it's yummy. But for a meal, give me a good old fashioned lamb roast any day. What hair and skin products do I use? Um, oof, a, a mixture, really. Um, I, don't, I don't like to wear a lot of makeup and I've never really done a lot of um, moisturizing and cleansing and toning and all that kind of thing with my skin. I think it's mostly important to think of the inside um, inside out approach. So, you know, eating really nutritious, healthy food that's not refined, um, that made a huge difference to my skin. Um, having plenty of meat stocks, which is really great for your skin and hair um, and nails. Also, um, lots of filtered water that's got the minerals in the water. So I use the Zazen filter because it remineralizes the water. Um, yeah, making sure that you're having good fats and plenty of eggs, so good for your skin and hair. 
Um, and then I use uh, like natural oils to cleanse my skin. So either um, hemp oil, um, a friend of mine has a hemp farm and I get oil off her. So that's the Lalella brand. Um, I also use, um, let's see, Merkaba oil for cleansing. Um, I can put the links below if you like. Um, and then I just basically put a little bit of the oil on in the morning on my skin. And then um, I use the Inica makeup. So that's just like either a foundation and a powder or sometimes just the powder. Um, I use the Era Perez concealer for like under the eyes or I've got a scar here, so I put it on there. Um, and a little bit of bronzer, Inica, um, Inica mascara. I use an eyebrow pencil and um, just lip gloss, like Haraw lip gloss, natural lip gloss. Um, I think that's about all. And for hair, um, I usually use shampoo bars and conditioner bars. The name of the brand I've been using, I think it's Cookie, something like that. It's in little tins, they're really good. And um, DNA leave-in conditioner, DNA brand and eco something hairspray if i need hairspray but yeah i just get it all from my organic hairdressers um, so if you find a good organic hairdressers you can get what you need there usually or online um, nourished life is a great place to shop for your makeup and hair stuff that's natural but yeah just be really aware that it doesn't matter how expensive your um your skincare routine is or how amazing if you're not working on gut health and the food that you eat and the water that you drink, um, getting out in the sunshine, you know, time in nature, all of that kind of stuff, your skin will have issues. Refined foods, um, especially refined vegetable oils, shocking for your skin um, and refined sugars. So yeah, just really work on those things. Best combinations of vegetables for fermenting oh i just use it just about everything <laughs> i absolutely love cabbage with a little bit of beetroot um, and a tiny bit of ginger or um, turmeric and a little tiny bit of garlic that makes a really nice sauerkraut um, you know dill all sorts of things so we kind of change it up all the time sometimes we'll put a bit of lemon in as in the whole thin slices um, red cabbage, carrot, um, and then I do beak vas as well. Um, sometimes I'll do carrot sticks or bean, green beans or things like that fermented. Um, I like doing orange slices, um, star anise, cinnamon, and um, trying to think what else in a sauerkraut. That's really nice. Um, but yeah, there's so many great ideas online. If you are in my quirky cooking chat group on Facebook, ask your fermenting questions in there because Gretty, um, who's my admin in the group, is an amazing fermenting queen. She's really, really great at answering all the fermenting questions if you've got any or if you want ideas. So pop in there and have a look. Foods that stabilize hormones. Well, from what I've learned from Elise and from Nat Kringidis and from other experts in this field, um, it's really important to have protein and fats at every meal. And especially first thing in the morning, you need some protein and fat in your breakfast. But yeah, every meal, protein and fat, that will really help to stabilize hormones. Also um, looking after your gut health and your liver health. Um, your body has to detox hormones and excess estrogen. So if your detox pathways aren't really healthy and working well, um, you will have problems with, the, with too much estrogen. Um, and I had that problem. I had all the gut health issues, the hormone issues, the fibroids, all the fun things. And so I learned it a bit late. So get onto it early, get some help from someone like Elise um, Comerford or Nat Kringidis if you need help with your hormone health. Um, they're amazing. Okay, there was um, another question on healthy swaps um, for 
I guess, favourite foods and all different things, but I think that's a whole podcast in itself. So I will have to do that another day. I'm going to get back to my garden and my meal planning and cleaning out the fridge and all that fun stuff today. Yay, Saturday. (laughs) Um, I hope you guys have a really great week and I will chat to you soon. lamb stock, lamb roast, veggies, which I haven't got around to make the gravy, beets, a bit of kohlrabi, there's something in the oven, I'm not sure what to call it, and a bit of mint, <laughs> that'll have to do. Thank <laughs> you.